people think of as Lyme disease is typically a mixture of infections. It's uncommon to get infected with just Bieberdorferi, the organism that causes Lyme. And these different infections have different propensities to set up chronic symptomatic infection. So there's Lyme disease caused by Borrelia. And of the Borrelia burgdorferi, which causes strict Lyme disease, is about 300 plus strains. And then there's other Borrelia species that we don't even have tests for. And they're cousins to Lyme disease, and they essentially cause the same thing. And one of those would be something like um, Masters disease, which Ed Masters made famous down in um, the south, that is caused by Borrelia lone starry. So uh, other infections spread by these same ticks, and I apologize for multitasking, include uh, anaplasma and ehrlichia, which are related bacteria, and they cause the syndrome of ehrlichiosis, which is typically manifest as a high fever and diffuse body aches and headaches and such with elevated liver functions and low platelets and low white count. And I always tell people, if I had to choose one tick-borne illness, choose ehrlichiosis, because it either is asymptomatic or very severe, and you get rid of it, and it doesn't have a propensity for chronic infection, whereas Lyme does, and so do the strains of Bartonella. Bartonella is kind of weird, because at least everybody's fighting about Lyme. Nobody really mentions Bartonella. Bartonella, there's a lot of strain heterogeneity. There's over 25 strains that we know of, and we only have a test for two. And some people with normal immune systems get very sick from it, and most people fight it off on their own. When people do get sick from Bartonella, it's harder actually to treat than Lyme. It's more drug resistant and requires somewhat different antibiotics. So if it's okay, I'll constantly, and there's Babesiosis, of course, and the two major strains around here are Microti and Duncani, which is Babesia WA1. And uh, so in order of propensity for chronic infection, it's Lyme and Bartonella, which set up the most chronic infection, and then Babesia, and then toward the last is Ehrlichia and Anaplasma, which are easily treated. So I'll concentrate on the evidence that documents uh, chronic infection and chronic Lyme disease, because there are two standards of care that currently exist. And um, when they've done studies to look at how long people, you know, regular general physicians are treating Lyme disease, um, I think I should do a sl the slideshow, I'm sorry. In Lyme endemic areas, they've come to the conclusion that 43% um, of these general physicians treat for disseminated Lyme. They treat for more than three months. And for chronic Lyme, the majority treat for more than three months. Yet um, some doctors make it out as if nobody treats for long-term Lyme apart from Lyme doctors. It's just that general physicians don't like to talk about it because nobody wants to be known as a Lyme doctor. Um, so when doctors and lawyers have gotten together and written uh, articles about this and done a medical legal assessment, they said that there were two equally divergent but completely different standards of care for treating Lyme. And they have equal legitimacy, but they're diametrically opposed. So this is best represented by two medical societies, and one is ILADS, which is International Lyme and Associated Diseases Society, and the other is IDSA. So ILADS basically says that, you know, bad cases of Lyme are serious. They have to be treated with antibiotics promptly, and aggressive antibiotics, even long-term, may be necessary. IDSA says there's no evidence that persistent infection exists after people take a standard course of antibiotics. And by that, they mean a short course, typically one month in length. And they say that antibiotic therapy doesn't help. It's not proven to help these people with chronic symptoms after Lyme disease. So here I'll go for the evidence at first um, showing chronicity of Lyme. So you, first I want to point out uh, the name in green. On the bottom there is Dr. Steer. Whenever you see a name in green, that's one of the Infectious Disease Society of America's guidelines authors, because this is actually his own study. So back in 1994, in the New England Journal of Medicine, they did a study of patients who were treated for different lengths of time and looked for Lyme DNA in their joint fluid. And they found that if they took less than, less than one month of oral antibiotics, 100%, they found the DNA of Lyme. If they took one to two months of orals or and antibiotics IV for three weeks, that 37%, they found the DNA of Lyme. And when people took multiple courses of antibiotics, they found it in 
So roughly one third of people despite multiple courses of antibiotics. They didn't specify what multiple courses of antibiotics were, how long it was, but the, um, the implication is that it was longer than the two month period for group two. And Dr. Steer says, quote, that the detection of outer surface protein A DNA, which is this uh, DNA from Lyme, in these joint fluid samples indicates the presence of viable spirochetes. So back then, in 94, he was saying that, boy, chronic Lyme exists, that it's chronic infection, and that was a long time ago, and yet the debate still rages on, whereas one of the IDSA guidelines authors kind of proved it way back then. And here, in this study of long-term patients who were treated with standard therapy, which is, again, a short course, uh, approximately, you know, three to four weeks of antibiotics, they found that 26% of them relapsed by one year and required retreatment, and 34% of them had long-term symptoms. And one of the patients in the study, one of the 38, ended up passing away from her Lyme disease, which had developed into hardcore neurologic features, and despite being treated with a total of four weeks of IV, which um, these folks would kind of make the claim that these are curative therapies for Lyme. So when she did pass away, they did an autopsy, and in her brain, they found spirochetes. So although this study was cited by the IDSA guidelines, this pertinent finding w was admitted, just like the study before. And this study also by Dr. Steer, they had 12 patients who failed antibiotics, and they found spirochetes that were alive in the joint tissue of half of them. And he makes the statement that the stimulus for Lyme arthritis is a small number of live spirochetes that stay alive for years. In the next study, again by Dr. Steer, IDSA guidelines author, they took a person who had passed away from a pulmonary failure, which they attributed to Lyme. In retrospect, this was in 1988, and they didn't really know about Babesia back then. It's unlikely that it was single agent Lyme that would cause an ARDS, acute, um, adult respiratory distress syndrome. It's probably that the person had co-infection that was causing an inflammatory response and, and the pulmonary failure. But nonetheless, after um, about a month of antibiotics total, inclusive of IV, she passed away and they found Lyme on the autopsy and the lymph nodes. And then in this study, um, from an American patient, a young woman had a Lyme rash after she went camping, and then years later developed a severe arthritis that was so bad that she needed multiple surgeries, and finally she had a positive Lyme test, and they said, aha, your arthritis is from Lyme. And she ended up getting um, two courses of IV penicillin, three courses of IV ceftriaxone, which is rocephin, and one course of intramuscular penicillin, and all of it helped, but she kept relapsing. And then she did doxycycline for over a year, which didn't help, and sulfasalazine, which is an immune suppressant, for over about a year, and that didn't help either. And despite all those antibiotics and all those relapses after therapy and responses to therapy, the, the joint tissue and joint fluid revealed spirochetes that were live, and the DNA identified them as Lyme spirochetes. And in this study of, and I won't present too many studies, I know this gets boring, I just want to make a point. I'm going to present in total 25 studies, but only go over maybe, I don't know, six of them in detail like this, because people always say, you're so boring. So, um, <laughs> I mean, I do get that a lot. So um, anyway, so here, this, pa this is uh, seven Lyme patients with uh, not just neurologic, but urology symptoms, and they were treated with an average of three weeks of IV ceftriaxone. 57% relapsed despite treatment, and um, the antibiotics were helpful in all patients, but despite the antibiotics, 71% remain symptomatic. Again, underlying this theme that the antibiotics help, but they're not magic, and they don't cure a lot of people. Um, in one of the patients, despite three weeks of ceftriaxone, they did find uh, Lyme, Bubidorferi, alive in the bladder biopsy, and it was confirmed with monoclonal antibodies. In this slide, um, this is interesting because, and I'll tell you why it's interesting afterwards. Uh, this is a woman that didn't have a history of a tick bite or a Lyme rash. She never had a positive blood test for Lyme. She never had a positive antibody test for Lyme in her spinal fluid. Yet, look at all the treatment she had. Seven rounds of IV antibiotics and three years of continuous oral antibiotics. And the only positive tests she had, which were 43% uh, of the time, uh, they were negative. So roughly half and half, her spinal taps were positive by some uh, research tests. 
So these two tests, the immune complex test and the outer surface protein A free antigen, are not commercially available. And the PCR is commercially available, but it was just really hit and miss with any positive testing on this woman. Yet she had all this very intensive therapy, and she would get severe Herxheimer's upon reinitiation of each antibiotic therapy. And when I say severe, I'm talking severe enough that she would be semi-comatose and paralyzed on one side of her body, and they couldn't prevent the Herxheimer's. The reason I say it's interesting is because one of the authors is Patricia Coyle, who's a physician from uh, Stony Brook, and she was one of the authors of a prior IDSA guidelines. And I always wondered, why would Patricia Coyle be involved in a case where they would treat somebody with negative blood tests for Lyme and no Lyme rash and no nothing, except for a couple of research tests showing positive on the spinal fluid with um, such long antibiotics? The, the patient in this study, it turns out, is a physician. And this is typical about how doctors treat themselves and get treated when they have Lyme. So there's a very big discrepancy. When a doctor gets Lyme disease, they generally do much better than the patients because they treat themselves longer, more aggressively. And I have to tell you that I have over 100 patients who are physicians who I've seen since 1996, and only three or four will treat Lyme disease, despite the fact that they have chronic Lyme themselves. And I think that's a very compelling commentary on the situation just politically with Lyme disease. Um, I like this study because they did brain biopsies on patients, and you don't do that very often. Um, this study, the had, first patient had a negative blood test, a negative spinal fluid antibody test, and no white cells in the spinal fluid, and they cultured Lyme from the spinal fluid despite completely negative tests. So they treated the patient with three weeks of IV ceftriaxone, partially improved, and then long-term doxycycline for eight months, but the patient relapsed. The Lyme DNA, the PCR, which stands again for polymerase chain reaction, is a method of amplifying DNA for Lyme was positive in both the plasma, which is part of the blood, and the bone marrow. So after that, there was still evidence of Lyme, and the patient passed away, uh, despite having restarted the ceftriaxone. And then on autopsy, they found Lyme in the brain. It was PCR positive. Patient number two, the person had a short window of an IgM-positive Lyme antibody test, and then it went negative, and the IgG never went positive. And the disease progressed, despite the antibodies never turning positive thereafter, just completely negative. And the spinal fluid was always negative for antibody and PCR. And without doing these brain biopsies, the person really couldn't have been diagnosed by a laboratory measure. So you always say, what's worse than one brain biopsy? Three brain biopsies. I mean, <laughs> it, it was positive in three separate samples. So this person failed seven weeks of ceftriaxone and almost nine months of really intensive oral antibiotics. And after stopping the antibiotics, there would be relapses and more brain lesions. And it was a very difficult course. And the Lyme DNA, the PCR was positive again in the plasma. So the person was finally treated with three and a half months of ceftriaxone. All the brain lesions resolved. And the patient remained well on long-term follow-up. So that's a happy ending. This is a good study because it's a large study. There's 165 patients. And all of them met the strictest CDC criteria for entry. And they're treated for a long time. They're treated for four, four months on average. And despite that, 19% still relapsed. And of those people who relapsed, 41% had evidence of persistent Lyme, be either culture, PCR, or both. And 85% of them had received IV ceftriaxone as part of their treatment. So all the patients are retreated. And 69% of them retreated patients responded again to antibiotics. Um, here I'm just going to just quickly say here's uh, five more studies. One of them I point out, I just say guidelines author in green, which document persistent infection despite uh, either recommended and or long-term antibiotic therapy. That means at least three weeks of antibiotics up to years of antibiotics. And again, by culture and or PCR, but primarily culture. So that's five studies, five more, and six more. So this is a total of 25 studies that I just presented by the most um, uh, accurate laboratory measures that we have available in all of medical science to document persistent infection. And despite that, and despite the fact that roughly 25% of those studies were written by IDSA guidelines authors, they still say there's no convincing biologic evidence for the symptomatic 
chronic Bieber-Dufferi infection among patients after recommended standard treatments. So it's one thing to say, I'm not aware of the data. I didn't know. It's another thing when you wrote it yourself. <laughs> so, but the other part of this recommendation is that they say that antibiotic therapy has not been proven to be useful and it's not recommended for patients with subjective symptoms. So let me just go over subjective versus objective. Subjective is when a patient has a symptom that the doctor can't see, and objective is when the doctor can see it. And so here is a study of early Lyme. They looked at what's objective and what's subjective. So in these patients with Lyme rashes, which is technically an objective feature, but that was the entry criteria, so we can't ignore that, they didn't have objective features. They didn't have AV block, which is a slowing of the heart uh, rhythm. They didn't have meningitis, they didn't have Bell's palsy, and they didn't have lesions in their brain and spinal cord. That's with acute Lyme. Only 10.8% had anything that was objective apart from the rash, and that's a low number. So what happens in the people that don't get the rash? A lot of people don't get the rash with Lyme. So what objective features? How do you diagnose early Lyme? Well, subjective features predominate. They were tired, they had body aches, they had headaches and chills and joint pain without swelling. All the things that you report to the doctor and say, I feel this way, but the IDSA is not recommending that doctors take that seriously. These patients who are subjective, we're not supposed to treat them. We're only supposed to treat what we see. And what about late Lyme? What's the, set, what's the, the ratio of objective to subjective features? Just like early Lyme is frequently diagnosed with an objective feature, erythema migrans, the rash, Late Lyme is frequently diagnosed with big arthritis or encephalomyelitis, like brain lesions or something else is objective. When you remove these objective features from the diagnostic criteria for late Lyme disease, then you get a different picture. So, oops, I went ahead of myself. Um, I'll go back. Here in this study, they, uh, they did just that. They said, we're not gonna diagnose late Lyme by any objective features. We're gonna diagnose it by the presence of the organism. So they took patients, 18 of them who failed antibiotics and were still symptomatic, and in all of them they found evidence of Lyme still in the body with electron microscopy or PCR. And they found that not only were 39% uh, initially blood test negative and then two-thirds of them were blood test negative later on in the illness, but that the rate of subjective features only, they're calling it, they called it non-specific features in the study, but they mean subjective, is, is very high. It's 50% initially and with later illness, it gets, um, it gets higher to two-thirds. So I'll just go back over here. So it shouldn't be a surprise to any of these folks, and again, Steer is highlighted here, that subjective features are common with Lyme because in the vaccine study, number one, they found that 11% of people converted asymptomatically to five-band IgG criteria, which is the CDC reporting criteria, which is a very difficult criteria, as some people in this room, I'm sure, know, to meet and yet 11% of them did, and they did so in an asymptomatic fashion. So if you can have asymptomatic Lyme, clearly you can have Lyme without a big swollen you know, joint. And, and then in Steer's study, they found that 16% had only subjective symptoms. So if you combine that together, they had 27% of people infected with Lyme without uh, objective features. So what I'm trying to say in a nutshell is, that there is good evidence in both early and late Lyme that subjective features predominates over objective features in Lyme disease. So if we take the advice of the IDSA, we won't be treating anybody because that's basically who we see. The people mostly have, the people look pretty good. So then the third part of this recommendation is that antibiotics have not been proven to be useful. So we'll analyze the studies that look at antibiotic retreatment of chronic Lyme. Um, there were four NIH-sponsored, randomized, controlled trials to retreat chronic Lyme patients with antibiotics, and two of them demonstrated benefits, and two did not. Uh, the two that did not, I'll address in the next slide, and they're part of one study that they divided up into from two trials. And then there were uh, three open-label trials, trials, which are not randomized controlled, which means they don't have a placebo arm. They just gave patients the antibiotics, and they kind of showed benefits. So. There are other studies besides this, but it's too much time to go over all of them. But in the first uh, two studies, um, I'm gonna analyze them one by one. Here, I was one of the authors on a paper that statistically analyzed all of these four studies to see which were valid and which weren't and how were they valid and how were they not. 
So in the first two studies, which again is represented by that one paper, and Klemper is an author on the IDSA guidelines, it turns out that their statistics were highly flawed. And uh, we published our paper in Contemporary Clinical Trials, which is a really good statistical uh, medical journal. And we found that in order for them to have detected a benefit from antibiotics, it was designed so that statistically, the uh, Lyme uh, treatment group would have had to improve to a level of health that was a full standard deviation superior to that of the general healthy population in order for them to detect the benefit. So if you, you, know, if you design a study like that, it's an unreasonable expectation. Antibiotics are not going to help you to play the piano if you can't play the <laughs> piano, and they won't make people healthier than the average person. You know, you can only reasonably expect them to bring them up toward the level of general health and not superior to that. Um, in the Krupp study, the, they had three outcomes that they were looking for, and it was only appropriately powered for one, which was the fatigue <laughs> outcome. And sure enough, sure enough, the, um, that outcome was the one that they showed a benefit to fatigue. Um, and then in the Fallon study, it was appropriately designed for cognitive, uh, to detect changes in cognition. And they did. They showed that there were cognitive benefits, but they were unsustained. So after antibiotics, they got better. And when they stopped them, they got worse, which is what the patients keep telling the doctors. You know. um, and then on reanalysis with subgroups, they found that fatigue and body pain also improved after antibiotics in the Fallon study. So my conclusions from looking at all this is that there is evidence. There's lots of evidence that, that bibidorphrite persists after short courses of antibiotics. And I think that the oversights by the IDSA guidelines, I like to use the word egregious because it sounds big, but it's, it's really, it really is. It sums it up. It's, uh, I think it's um, an inexcusable kind of situation. I, I can't fathom how this is uh, something that is currently exists in, in uh, practicing physicians. But it's the way it is. And I don't tell people, so, you know, people come to me all the time, they say, my doctor doesn't believe in Lyme. I say, it's not a religion. You know, it, it's, um, you know, the facts are the facts. Either we, uh, we choose to ignore the facts or we choose to accept the facts. But you can't change, you know, the truth. You can only, you just have to look at what it is. So, right, so here I'd like to, if it's okay, go over a few cases, because this will help to kind of, I think, pull everything together and maybe you know, people really like to know how do you treat Lyme? How do you know what people have, whether it's Lyme or Bartonella or whatever? So here's the case. I don't usually see children, but they called me up and the parents really begged me to, um, this is a very nice family, so I said yes. I, I see down to 16 with both parents, but I saw down to 15 this time because this is her story. She had very typical Lyme arthritis. It wasn't controversial at all. She's from a highly endemic area in Massachusetts for Lyme disease. She had CDC positive, positive ELISA, and almost all bands on the Western blot, and she had a big swollen knee. She had the very stereotype of Lyme arthritis, and she was treated with doxycycline, and it helped, and when she went off the doxycycline, it came back. And the doctor said, there's nothing more that we can do. The only option that you have is surgery. So they took out the joint tissue on a 15-year-old girl, who was an athletic girl, and it didn't help. And they, the parents were desperate. They went back to the physician. They said, isn't there anything? And they went from doctor to doctor. They finally found an infection. These doctors said, well, I guess it's possible we could treat you with rocephin, which is the intravenous antibiotic. So they gave her a month of uh, rocephin, and it did help. And she was about 90, 95% better with the knee arthritis for about eight months. And then she uh, played sports and did fun things, and it was pretty normal life. She got appendicitis and had just a day of antibiotics during the acute appendicitis, and that one day of antibiotics started the whole cycle all over again, and her arthritis came back. So she went back to the doctors. They said, now your only option is methotrexate, which is a chemotherapy drug to destroy the immune system. So the parents were horrified, and they said, well, let me take you to another doctor. So they went to a rheumatologist, who's one of the IDSA uh, rheumatologists, and he concurred. He said methotrexate is the most appropriate option. So rather than, she has a, a, a history of responding twice to antibiotics, it's not like the antibiotics didn't work, you know. So this, the reason I bring this up is this didn't happen 15 years ago, this happened three months ago. And this is the standard that still exists in Massachusetts. So if you think it's bad here, just be thankful you live in Connecticut, because Massachusetts is even worse. And uh, so what will I treat her with? You know, the usual, we'll start with tetracycline. I did a month of that, and she got some partial improvements. Physical therapy said that her range of motion was improving. And um, 
and it should be switched over to biaxin and plaquenil. People are like, what's plaquenil? What's biaxin? Biaxin is a common antibiotic that's used for bronchitis and you know, upper respiratory infections and such. Plaquenil is an anti-malarial antibiotic that rheumatologists have used for various forms of arthritis, and they've used it for many, many decades without never knowing how it works. So um, most people probably know that Lyme was first thought to be rheumatoid arthritis a long time ago. Um, Lyme has had its hooks in rheumatic disease since the very beginning of Lyme disease. And it's like one big Venn diagram. People frequently tell me, well, which is it? Do I have Lyme or do I have rheumatoid arthritis? And I'm saying, yes. You know, so it's not, it's like saying, do you live in Wilton or do you live in Connecticut? You know, they're not mutually exclusive. So rheumatoid arthritis is a descriptive diagnosis. Um, Lyme disease is an infectious disease diagnosis. All the rheumatology diagnoses are descriptive. It may be that there are four causes of rheumatoid arthritis, or 14, and maybe that Lyme is one of them, and maybe these other infections, like Bartonella, is one of them. I personally believe that um, Bartonella-type infections are much more uh, common in inflammatory arthritis than, than Lyme, actually. So for hardcore inflammatory arthritis, I frequently suspect Bartonella more than Lyme even. So, uh, but Plaquenil has been published to kill cystic forms of Lyme, and cystic forms, they've since changed the name to round bodies, and they're these kind of resistant forms of the organism that start to convert after about six weeks of exposure to antibodies in the blood, and they will convert in response to antibiotics. They're a protective form, and there are four antibiotics, well, there are three that are published to kill cystic forms, and there's Flagyl, Tindamax, and Plaquenil, and Plaquenil, again, is an antimalarial antibiotic. So Plaquenil, I think, works in three ways. It works because it has a small anti-inflammatory effect. It works by killing Lyme round bodies or cystic forms. And it also synergizes with macrolides because it stabilizes them inside lysosomes, which are acid-containing compartments in the cell. It neutralizes the acid, and then the macrolide antibiotics like Baxin and Zithromax don't get destroyed as much. So anyway, I just figured I'd elaborate on just one of these cases here. And then the next case. So this young lady came to see me from Pennsylvania. And I just saw her yesterday. I told her I'd like to present her case, and she said, absolutely, please do. I want everyone to learn. Is it okay? So a few years ago, she had mild arthritis. It was really nothing, and a tiny bit of psoriasis. And she was diagnosed with psoriatic arthritis. But she was running half marathons, and she was literally fine. And then in the summer of 2013, she got a really high fever, 105. She got really bad arthritis. Her foot blew up to like the size of a football, and she had a positive Lyme test. And the doctors were like, this is clearly Lyme, and treated her with doxycycline. And during the doxycycline, she got the new onset of atrial ventricular block. The AV block is a slowing electricity through the heart. So sometimes when you treat, even objective things pop up. Everybody knows about the subjective stuff that pops up during treatment, Herxheimer reactions, that people feel like garbage. But sometimes people will get a Bell's palsy. Sometimes the arthritis gets more inflamed, and you can see it. Sometimes things. What does I just do? And sometimes things like, um, uh, like I said, like the AV block will show up, which did with her. And then they uh, got nervous that she had an objective feature in addition to the arthritis, so they started on rocephin. And the AV block went away, but the arthritis didn't just not go away, it progressed. It continued to get worse and worse. And by the time she uh, came to see me, she could barely walk, and her foot was like this. And her toes were like sausage digits. It was like typical um, psoriatic arthritis as it's described, and her CRP was 30. CRP is a C-reactive protein. It's a measure of inflammation. And I was suspicious about Bartonella because of the failure of the rocephin and uh, the high level of inflammation and her inflammatory arthritis and her prior psoriatic history. Um, so I started doxycycline, Zithromax is the first thing, and wouldn't you know, brucellosis antibody test came back borderline. So brucella, I didn't talk about yet, is the most common zoonotic infection in the world. It's uh, prevalent everywhere except for here. In the United States, they say it's one out of three million to get it in the United States. So I have six patients that I diagnosed in the last six months with brucellosis. Um, and I didn't send them out anywhere. I didn't send them to uh, fancy labs. We're talking Quest and LabCorp. And I don't know that she has brucella or not, to be honest. She could have just a, a bad Bartonella that's cross-reacting. So brucella and Bartonella are, um, evolutionary-wise, they are related. So they are close cousins. I, I think it's possible that she could just have a nasty Bartonella that's cross-reacting with brucella. But they're treated the same way. 
And, um, you know, I treated her with a combination of doxycycline, rifampin, and Bactrim, and she had really prompt resolution of her um, of arthritis. She felt great, and her CRP went to 1.8 within two months, and she was doing quite well. And coincidentally, the psoriasis that she had for three years, uh, which never really bothered her all that much, but she had it for three years, just gone, went away. So the reason she came back to see me is she went and she followed up, now that everything's under control, she followed up with a local doctor who she thought would be able to you know, take care of her, and it was kind of a mess, and uh, without going into details, so she came back here after a few months of spiraling down and relapsing. So um, that's her story. So you say, well, is there anything in the literature that these antibiotics, like rifampin and, you know, uh, Bactrim and things like this, that they can, they can work for inflammatory arthritis? And the answer is yes. So in the first study, they used it with the presumptive target of chlamydia pneumonia, or not chlamydia, but I think it was chlamydia trachomatis, but they didn't have testing for chlamydia there. They blame chlamydia on a lot of things sometimes. Chlamydia can cause a reactive arthritis. A reactive arthritis is a type of inflammatory arthritis after an infection. And um, in this study, the first one they show that doxycycline and rifampin were helpful for arthritis that involved the spine. And typically, Bartonella and Brucella are arthritis type, um, are a, uh, arthritis producing bacteria that will focus on the spine. So, and in the next study, they show that rifampin reduced uh, psoriasis with a very high um, statistical probability. So that p-value, if there are any statisticians in the crowd, of 0 .0008, is extremely low. That means that the odds of rifampin helping psoriasis by chance would be like uh, one out of, a little less than one out of a thousand. Um, and then they also show that uh, Bactrim, a review article which references multiple studies show that Bactrim works for rheumatoid arthritis. So you figure, why don't rheumatologists use antibiotics more often if there's all this data showing that it works for inflammatory arthritis? I don't know the answer, really. But I do know that, um, that every time I see a commercial on television for, um, you know, an immunosuppressive drug, it's, it's like every other commercial is an immunosuppressive drug uh, for rheumatoid arthritis. I know they're quite expensive. So um, here's a, a patient who had uh, a very common Lyme presentation, and probably the most common kind of alternate diagnosis for Lyme is fibromyalgia. Fibromyalgia is kind of a vague diagnosis. It's uh, a lot of the symptoms of Lyme. It's fatigue and headaches and muscle pain and sleep disturbance and mild cognitive deficits and everything that's on this Lyme symptom checklist. They keep expanding the, the checklist for fibromyalgia. It includes like everything of Lyme now. And they've done studies with patients with fibromyalgia after well-documented Lyme and they have found Lyme DNA in the, um, in the muscles of these patients, but I digress. So this person had um, a history of three years of sleep disturbance, followed by one year of joint and muscle pain. And then she started getting weakness and started dropping things. Her grip strength was decreasing. And when she came to see me, I did MRIs, and she had 24 brain lesions, no spinal cord lesions. Her Lyme tests were negative, and her co-infection tests were negative. Her CD57 was normal, and her CRP was 13. What does she have? I'm not really sure. I know she has something. You know, I think that um, Lyme is more likely to cause brain lesions than the other co-infections because there's cross-reaction against the talus spirochetes. It's called flagellin. Myelin in MS, it cross-reacts with flagellin immunologically. So to the immune system, when it sees the protein in the talus spirochetes, it looks almost the same as myelin, which is the surrounding of nerves. So um, I figured she's was it was really impacting on her life, and I gave her doxycycline, which no doctor would give her. And I always tell people, you know, I was on doxycycline for three years for acne, and I was on the same dose for Lyme. I mean, I, still, I don't get it. I mean, she went to about seven or eight doctors, and her doctor still puts Lyme disease in quotes in the letters that he sends me. Everything else that she has, whether it's, you know, high cholesterol or anything, is no quotes, but Lyme is always in quotes. <laughs> so. So I gave her doxycycline and she had a prompt uh, response and uh, her neurologic exam actually normalized completely after, um, after uh, one month of doxycycline because when I first saw her, she had terrible grip strength and her proximal legs were weak. And then by the second month, I gave her tetracycline, she had a big Herxheimer and she got su substantial benefits after that. And then a third month, I gave tetracycline and fluconazole and she continued to improve and uh, she had a really big flare 
And you say, well, why am I doing it in this kind of pattern? Doxycycline, then tetracycline, and then tetracycline and fluconazole. Like, what's going on in your mind that you're doing this in this way? Why do you pick these antibiotics? Why are you spacing them? Because I'm trying to minimize these Herxheimers. This person already had grip strength problems, has brain lesions, she has leg strength problems. If she had a really big Herxheimer initially, it would probably be scary for her and she would never come back and I would lose the ability to help her, you know? And that would be a, a, a very a big, a big sadness. The, um, uh, so doxycycline, in most cases, I believe tetracycline works better than doxycycline in most cases. It's a higher dose. The standard dose of tetracycline is 1,500 milligrams. Standard dose of doxy is 200 milligrams. Most Lyme doctors use higher to get into the brain. Tetracycline doesn't cause the sunburn that doxy does. And tetracycline is less protein bound, which means it has a lower, you know, a shorter half-life, but it's more bioavailable. So there is one study by Dr. Danta, who's an infectious disease doctor, who's a big proponent of tetracycline. I tried it once, and I really do think it works better. Why did I use fluconazole? Fluconazole is an antifungal. Why would that work for Lyme? Well, you know, people think that bacteria and parasites and fungi are so different. We share like 95% the same DNA with zebrafish, you know? We're all not that different, and bacteria and fungi and parasites aren't that different either. So fluconazole is the number one treatment for leishmaniasis, which is a parasitic infection. Um, antimalarials like Plaquenil is shown to kill Lyme, which is technically a bacteria. There's a lot of overlap between these classes. So a doctor in Germany had done a small study with people who had failed prior antibiotics and used fluconazole, and it worked in two-thirds of the cases. And the value of fluconazole is when it does work is brain penetration. There is no barrier when it comes to fluconazole. It gets right into the brain. So anyway, she's done very well. And um, then I have this patient who, uh, is, she's an 18-year-old from northern New England. A uh, history of multiple tick bites, um, no Lyme rash, and she started with symptoms at age 13. Joint pain, then severe abdominal pain, very severe constipation. She's been to all the major teaching hospitals at the best hospitals in Boston, upper endoscopy, colonoscopy, camera pill. They can't find anything wrong with her. She's, she goes to the bathroom once like every two weeks. She's so unbelievably constipated. She Joints hurt all over. She's in agony. She's got fevers every day up to her, like 101 worse in the afternoon, and she's had uh, spontaneous uh, rhythm disturbances with her heart, where her heartbeat goes up to 187 for absolutely no reason. And on top of that, she's developed very severe neuropsychiatric symptoms, horrible depression, anxiety, she's anorexic, she cuts herself, she is uh, very, on paper, I said to her, I was like, on paper, you look like a train wreck, but you're delightful. Because, <laughs> you know, she is so well-spoken and intelligent, you can't even, it's mind-blowing, and um, but she's very, very sick. I've just had the opportunity to start working with her. I hope that she gets better. It's too soon to tell, but when I did her antibody test, her um, Western blot showed IgM 41, and then we did a, a local lab, and then we did a Western blot at Igenix, which I didn't put down here, which is positive, and her CRP was 71. I mean, that's really high for a, an 18-year-old girl to have a CRP of, of 71. It's a lot of inflammation. And um, so I gave her doxycycline and she had an unbelievably severe flare, like she was in agony and she couldn't tolerate it. And her neuropsych stuff flared up tremendously too, which kind of speaks toward the link of infection and you know, psychiatric illness, which I'm sure Dr. Bransfield will speak toward. Um, this is a patient, uh, I've always been interested in the relationship of Lyme to MS. I've been interested in this for a long time. So this is one of my MS patients. He, oh crap, sorry. He had, um, uh, he's 43, he had a Lyme rash in 2001, he was treated with a short course of doxycycline, and then he was okay. And then in 2006, presented with severe uh, neurologic symptoms, numbness over his entire body, he became rapidly debilitated, and within a short period of time, five minutes, okay, yeah, almost done. Within a short period of time, he was like completely disabled, couldn't work. He begged his doctor for uh, treatment for Lyme, and the doctor said no. So instead, they gave him IV cellumedrol, fine, standard treatment for MS, I understand that. It made him worse. And then they tried him on beta seron, he got worse. He begged his doctor again for antibiotics, he gave him minocycline for a month, and it made him better. And then he stopped it, and he relapsed. Then he came to see me, and I treated him very aggressively. And um, after uh, a couple of years, uh, his uh, brain and cervical spine MRIs improved dramatically and his thoracic spine lesions resolved completely. So he had about 40 lesions initially and like 90% of the lesions went away with antibiotic therapy. He ended up getting to like a ceiling of like plateau on antibiotics with no further improvement 
with the lesions and no further benefits. He started then an alternate therapy called Rife Machines, which he continued to improve further. And then he went back to work. And then I had my unfortunate sabbatical of no walking for two years. And then, um, whatchamacallit, uh, I, when I was out of commission, he uh, went to another doctor and very rarely got antibiotics. Like every you know, six months would take a couple weeks here and there, but very few antibiotics. And when I came back, he came back to see me, not feeling so good, and he got four new brain lesions on his, um, on his MRIs. So it was an interesting kind of thing because we documented how his lesions went away with antibiotics and no further lesions over a period of six years with antibiotics. And then his further benefit to these alternative therapies, which I think, you know, who knows, it's, uh, I think there's value in, in looking at all aspects of stuff. Um, but showing that just on the alternative therapies without the antibiotics, how he had recurrence of brain lesions and some reduction of his performance. So. Um, He's a nice guy. Anyway, so there's multiple authors that have said that Bieberdorferi infection, Lyme, can be indistinguishable to MS. That um, in this study, they found Lyme cysts, those round bodies in the spinal fluid for every MS patient and not from the healthy people. Why isn't this making the front page of the New York Times? Um, and so there are authors that have concluded that Lyme is one of the likely causes of MS. And I love this one because it's uh, just by county epidemiology, uh, MS deaths versus Lyme deaths throughout the country. Does anybody see an overlap? <laughs> so anyway, I think that concludes uh, my talk. I want to thank you all for your attention.